Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at Tamiya's 1-48 scale Bristol Bow Fighter. This is definitely an iconic kit from Tamiya and it's been out for a while, so let's see how I get on with it. Hope you enjoy. So then, the first stage for this kit is going to be building up the interior. Although World War II era aircraft usually have quite complex interiors, Tamiya managed to build it up with just a handful of parts. This includes fitting a couple of the uh, seats along with some back walls and one or two other details. Although this kit is nearly 30 or 40 years old, there is no flash to be seen on any of the parts throughout this kit. This does result in a very speedy and enjoyable build. My entire interior was built up within just two days and the entire kit built within just a week. Looking back more at the kit, all of the details are definitely crisp, but I wouldn't say incredibly enhanced like they're there. However, it wouldn't make you say, wow, that's a lot of detail. Because of this, it gave me an ideal opportunity to put my hand at some scratch building. I've never personally done any scratch building. However, I do have some lead wire laying around, which I thought I'd make use of. All I did was pretty much look at a couple of reference images, see where wires and pipes would have been and try to replicate them the be as best I could. They were all cemented in place using VMS's Flexi CA superglue. As I was on a little bit of a scratch building high, I thought, you know what? I'll also add some masking tape seat belts. These were made up of just masking tape and then folded into some shapes which looked rather convincing. I think it would have been a good idea to add some ripples and maybe a couple of folds into them just to give them another level. Once I was happy with how everything looked, I can give the entirety of the interior a nice coat of Ammo Mig's one shot primer, then followed by Tamiya's XF71 cockpit green. This went down an absolute treat, and I also think this is probably the most convincing cockpit green colour on the market. This was sprayed down very evenly, very uniformly. I'm not going to be doing any special techniques really in the painting process, but instead we're going to leave that to the weathering to create any of my fake shadows and tonal variation. The main reason for me not using Tamiya's acrylics and Tamiya's colours more often is just due to the fact that you can't get them very easily in this country at the minute and also due to their colour selection probably not being as extensive as someone like Ammo Mix. Once the cockpit green colour has fully settled and fully dried I can then come in and pick out some of the details. Here you can see me picking out one of the scratch built pipes which I put in in just a white colour. The main colours I'm going to be using for detail painting is going to be whites, metallic colours, reds and maybe one or two yellows. Reflecting back now, potentially my masking tape seat belts might have been a bit too chunky. I'll put this down to them just being super super safe and using an extra strong and thick material. Once details were all painted and I was personally happy, I can now use a gloss varnish to protect all my work from the upcoming weathering stages. The gloss varnish I'm using is VMS's gloss varnish. This is a pre-thinned airbrush ready gloss varnish which I use in quite a lot of my builds. Here I've used it to provide a brilliant base for me to use a pin wash to create some fake shadows and really draw out all of those lovely details of the struts on the interior. I believe this wash is AK's Dark Wash, that is the exact name, I'm not making that up, and it is really easy to clean up and blend in just using a clean brush really doused in some white spirit. I can then move on to using a whitewash in the cockpit just to bring out some of the details which is absorbed by the black colour. Potentially white could be a bit too harsh here so instead maybe using a light grey or even a dark grey could work better here and not look so unnatural as per se. That being said, it does highlight all the detail very well. Once I was happy with all my weathering, I'm now going to use VMS's matte varnish to seal all of my work in. I prefer a matte varnish for the interior just because it doesn't give you any of the, the glints and the glimmers of a gloss varnish. Once I was happy with how it looked, I can now actually start to bring everything together. The interior sub-assembly fits into one half of the fuselage incredibly well, almost like a glove. Here you can see the access door being slotted into its hinge system, which is very nicely engineered, and then I can bring the other half of the fuselage and mount them both together, sealing in all of my hard work, which will never be seen again. But 
that's absolutely fine as that is just part of modeling. The fit here is really, really good. It's that normal Tamiya quality of fit. However, of course there is still going to be a seam. So to sort out this seam, I'm going to be using VMS's Flexi CA Superglue. I love using this to sort out my seams because it's flexi, it's not going to crack once it's being sanded down and it's been left to dry. It's just a brilliant material to use for getting rid of any of your stubborn seams. With seams all sorted, I can now move on to another sub-assembly. The main engine is very simply just moulded out of one piece, however that doesn't impact the quality of the detail. There are still some really nice recessed details which will be nicely detailed up later. So for painting the engines I'm going to be using AK's Extreme Metal Colour Aluminium as this is possibly the shiniest metal that I know on the market and it's incredibly easy to use. Once that is dried, I'm then going to use the dark wash again to bring out all of those recessed details that I was talking about. Capillary reaction will bring this wash all the way around so you don't have to worry about using a huge amount of wash. The only thing I would say is make sure that your surface is very glossy otherwise the capillary reaction just does not work as well. So with the details on the engines all sorted out, I can now move on to looking at the wings. So the wings on the bow fighter do actually have a change in angle and Tamiya very cleverly model this by sectioning up the wing in such a way that it still replicates these angles almost perfectly. The fit here is also astonishing, albeit there is one or two little areas on the leading edge of the wing which will have to of course be sorted out but that's nothing out of the ordinary. With the big chunky wings out of the way, we can move on to some less chunky wings, also known as the horizontal stabilizers. These follow the very basic construction of having two halves and slapping them together. Uh, luckily, the tab also does have molded the correct angle. Interestingly, the Bowfighter has a positive dihedral. You don't usually see that too much, or at least not to this extent on uh, aircraft of this era, so definitely an interesting feature of the Bowfighter. Other elements to go on now include the nose cone along with the radiator and just trying to bring everything together now before we can get onto the painting stage. This includes masking off the canopy. The canopy definitely has quite a bit of glass on it but they're quite big pieces of glass so it's not the end of the world. So these were all masked off by myself just laying some masking tape over the certain areas using a cocktail stick to indent and find out where the frames are and then very carefully cutting them out. Once that was done, I can then actually put the glass onto the model. It went on quite well, however, it definitely needed a little bit of force to keep it in place. I unfortunately got quite unlucky in this kit and the fact that my rear gunner's glass piece was a little bit weirdly misshapen and meant that it wouldn't fit correctly and also the glass wasn't very clear. So I had to use the alternative in the kit, which definitely wasn't the end of the world, it just isn't as accurate as it probably could have been. So with all of the glass in place, I can now actually do a little bit of painting. I'm going to be painting the interior cockpit green color, that XF71 I believe, which I used earlier, and just putting it over the frames to make sure that the interior of the frames is also the same as the interior green color, as we don't want to have some, you know, beige or middle stone uh, <laughs> colored frames. It will just look out of place. So I'm now going to use uh, Mr. Surfacer uh, 1200 just to reveal any of the imperfections that I might have on the model. I like to use my Mr. Surfacer just because it is in a grey colour and in my opinion grey just helps me personally to see the imperfections far more clearly than something like black. However, once everything's been rescribed, I can now use Ammo Meg's One Shot Primer to give a lovely uniform black surface which will then be painted on with the final colours. So before I can do that, I like to try and paint everything that I can at the same time. This just helps for the continuity of the model and it helps everything look more uniform and look more put together and less all over the place. So I'll put on the engine nacelles and then I'll get to painting. So the first colour which I'm going to be putting down is going to be the lighter colour in the camo scheme, which is going to be this middle stone colour. I'm going to be using Ammo Mix colours here, however, I did have a small issue for once with these. However, I will get into that later. Firstly, let's talk about what I'm spraying with for the majority of this build. I'm going to be using my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution with a 0.3mm nozzle and needle, and on the whole, spraying at about 25 to 30 psi. 
you might have realized that I'm not doing any pre-shading techniques here, such as, uh, you know, mottling or maybe using a stencil like I have in the past. And this is because for this model, I want to try and use some of my post-shading techniques and also see if I can create more visual interest through my weathering. So the issue that I had was the Ammo MIG paint left a bit of a, a bobbly effect, which I really didn't like. So I had to use some incredibly high grit sandpaper, about two or three thousand to try and dull these down and make it a bit more uniform of a surface. It wasn't perfect, but it was far better than it was, but it did also create a couple of scratches and imperfections in the paint job, but I just kind of rolled with it. So what I'm now going to do is do a bit of post shading. Um, so what I've done is I've got my middle stone color and I've added one or two drops of white just to lighten it up a little bit. And then I'm going to select one or two panels and spray it in the middle and just try and make them you know, a little bit lighter and leave a little bit of depth on the outside. But generally I'm trying to go for a bit of a patchy appearance here. As the scheme that I'm doing was in Malta, it definitely would have been in quite a tropical environment, which would have led to having a bit of a faded and patchy paint job. So now that I'm happy with how the middle stone color looks, I can move on to doing the other color on the camouflage. Tamiya actually provided this sheet in the kit and it was luckily in one to one or you know, the same scale as the model. So all I had to do was with my blade, trace the, uh, trace around the outline and I had some brilliant templates which was so helpful. With the templates all stuck in place just using some blue tack and also some masking tape I can spray down the dark earth colour. I did make one or two changes for spraying down the dark earth colour. I swapped out my airbrush for my cheaper £20 uh, Fender airbrush off of Amazon which I usually just use for primers and glosses and actually it didn't give me a bumpy surface so potentially there was something up with my airbrush. Nonetheless, the spraying was really the same in the fact that I didn't want to go too heavy on the coats as I didn't want to have a really big paint bleed underneath the templates as that just that would just look mucky. I then did the exact same faded panel effect as I did on the middle stone color and this was the final result looking very very patchy indeed. So I can now pull off all of the templates and see the lovely outline underneath. There was definitely a little bit of overspray, but it looked quite authentic. So I just kind of rolled with it. As you can see from me pulling off the template, there are one or two bits of blue tack left behind. So instead of ripping these off with your you know, fingers and potentially damaging the paint job, I do recommend that you do what I'm doing here and just use a big glob of blue tack and then it will just kind of rip itself off without ripping any of the paint with it so there you go top tip from me looking onto the underside i did have to approach this a little bit differently as the underside of aircrafts don't really see the sun their paint doesn't get faded in the same way so to create the effect that i'm personally looking for i'm going to be using a technique called black basing this just highlights the interiors of the panel and leaves us with a nice accentuated panel line which i think looks far better one of the final things to do in regards to painting is going to be masking off the fronts of the cowlings and spraying them in this old brass colour. It's an iconic feature on the Bowfighter that they have these almost coppery burnt metal coloured cowlings and it looks pretty good. The only thing that I would say is that the Ammo MIG metallic pigments are far too big as in you can really see that it almost looks pigmenty and I don't really like that. Nonetheless it still looks very very good. After a day or so of painting, we can now go back on some sub-assemblies. Specifically here, we are looking at the landing gear legs. So the Bowfighter is actually rather big and because of that, I was a little bit worried about the integrity of the landing gear legs. However, of course, Tamiat have it covered. This system has a superb amount of detail, which can definitely be taken further if wanted, uh, but it is still an incredibly strong and stable platform for your model to sit on. So I'm now going to start to bring everything together, including the props and all of the other little bits and pieces, just so they can all be coated in Vallejo's acrylic gloss varnish. And it also gives us a good base to do the deckling. Unfortunately, I lost the footage for the decals going down. However, they did go down quite well, as in they're not, you know, mind-meltingly horrendous, uh, but they're not incredible, but they're, they're workable. 
So the gloss varnish also gives me a perfect base for doing my first bit of weathering, which is going to be a pin wash. I'm using two pin washes here, a burnt sienna color for the middle stone color, and then a dark shadow brown color for the darker, of course, dark brown color. So the reason for me using two pin washes instead of just one is the fact that the burnt sienna color just doesn't pop as much on top of the dark brown color and it almost fades in. So using that just really helps that you have continuity in your model, as in the panel lines are equally as vivid on different parts of the camo. The next thing that I'm going to do is accentuate some fading on one or two of the panel lines. To do this, I've got an old piece of card and I'm going to be spraying Tamiya's smoke along some of the panel lines. And this just gives this really interesting kind of shaded, faded effect along some of the panel lines. I don't want to do this on all of them, just accentuate it on a couple of them. And it gives some tonal variation, which I probably didn't have enough of at this stage in the build. So as you can see from this little spin around of the model, it definitely gives another level to the model. I'm not saying it gives a, like another level of realism, but it just gives your eyes something else to look at. At this stage, I was very happy with how the model looked and I was tempted to stop here, but I thought, you know what, we might as well go all out. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to do some localized dirt and grime around some of the panel lines. To do this, I'm once again using the respective colors of Burnt Sienna and a Shadow Brown, and then just going to be dabbing just a tiny bit around some of the um, edges and corners of panel lines, and then blending and mixing it in using a clean brush with some white spirit. This just gives this sort of effect, as I said, of localized dust and grime around some of the areas, and once again, add some visual interest. I had two mixes of oil paints here, one which was slightly diluted with white spirit, which was more, you know, of course, more translucent, and one with just straight oil paint. The straight oil paint gives you a much harsher effect. Um, as you can see here, I'm using more of just a straight oil paint. In regards to the first clip, it was more of my diluted solution. So you can kind of see the differences and how they look. A little goes a long way with oil paints, so definitely don't do huge globs and blobs, otherwise you're just going to have to get rid of it all using some white spirit as it's going to be far too accentuated. So by using some diluted oil paint and not too much of it, you can slowly build up the effect to your desired outcome. You can also alter what the effect looks like in regards to how much white spirit is on your clean brush. So it's definitely something to play around with the next time you're doing one of these uber dirty models. One of the final things that I personally wanted to do in regards to the weathering was do this sort of highlight areas around the corners of some of the panels. Very simply, almost straight oil paint brushed around the edges of some of the panels and then blended in, not a huge amount here, uh, with some white spirit. It's an effect which I don't really know what it's trying to do. I think it's just almost regions of like extreme faded paint, but I really like how it looks, but I think it's more like Marmite. You either like it or you hate it. So I'll leave that for you to decide. So with all of those effects and layers being built up in the weathering process, this is how we were looking. I was quite happy with how it looked. Um, I don't know if this is exactly how I imagined the build going when I first started out, but I was happy with the result. To seal all of my work in, I'm going to be using VMS's Satin Varnish. This just gives a really nice effect where it isn't uber uber matte and you know light absorbent matte, but it still has a little bit of glisten and gleam to it in the right lighting. So now it was on to the final bits and bobs. That includes taking off the masking tape from all the canopies and also putting some of the rigging onto the antenna. And that was this build finished. So I hope you have enjoyed my take on Tamiya's Bowfighter, an incredible kit to build. Next time we're going on to something a little bit different, but until then, enjoy the final photos and videos and I'll see you again soon guys. Bye bye.
Thank you.